Okay, we are live for another episode of the Marketers Roundtable. So today we got Ty uh, Frankel, right? I pronounced the last name right. Uh, so yeah, so uh huh, uh huh. So I've been seeing Ty's content. I first discovered you in the Nothing Held Back group. Um, if you guys are not in that community, that is literally one of the best like marketing, it, like the best marketing community you can find on Facebook. Um, super high quality content. Um, this is this isn't promo for them, but like the, the community is like not parasitic like a lot of other marketing groups. It's like everyone's trying to like just helping people, giving the best info. So you, you guys should join that group. So Ty was one of those people um I saw engaging in that group, giving super useful advice. And so um I added him, um, just started following this content. And I just I just love his copy, it's just super source, straight to the point, and his you know, in-depth Thank content. It's like he really he really breaks things down. Um, you could just tell he's a legit guy. Um, I, I don't know if you consider yourself in the agency education space at all. I do. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, he's one, he's one of the um, uh, quality guys I see in the agency education space. So just to give you guys a vested interest in who he is, if you don't know him, right, he skilled his agency shutdown music. Do you still operate it? Nah, so I quit November 2020, but I'm still making like 150k a year off royalties from it, and that'll be happening nice. for the next five, 10, 15 years, which is cool. Oh, so yeah, we're gonna have to talk about that because that, that's interesting. So he scaled his agency, shut down um, music to 50k per month. Um, he's won four prominent music awards. He was the youngest ever to sign a joint venture label deal with Universal Music at 21. How old are you now? 24. I'll be 25 in September. So I'm getting old, man. I actually, I actually saw my first couple of gray hairs here in the past couple of months on my beard. So. Uh, 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 yeah, nice, nice. nice. Are you, what, what is that? Like Leo, September. I think that's Leo season, right? Is it? I don't. Shit, bro. Virgo, I Leo. Know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> not my. Uh, I'm not too much. Uh, I think like Sagittarius. I don't know, bro. Uh, I have to uh, look it up. But. Okay, and then um, and your. Sure. And then you said you're uh, controversial in Japan, and then you produced a song for G Herbo, which is one of my favorite. Conversational in Japanese. Oh, in Japanese. I mean, shit, I don't know. I might be controversial in Japan too. Uh, I don't know, bro. So what, what? What do you mean by what do you mean by uh, controversial in Japanese? Conversational. So like, I'm I'm nearly fluent in Japanese. Oh, oh, oh! I don't know why yeah. I read controversial. Oh, I see now. Might be. I don't know what they're doing over there, but I uh, might be. <laughs> I gotta change that. Yeah, I might have to go over there again and check it out. I gotta change that to promo post, man. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we're gonna be talking everything from personal branding, agency systems, and cold email. So, um, yeah. when people ask you, "What do you do?" What do you tell them? <clears throat> what do I tell them? So basically, what I do is I help agency owners that are either starting from scratch or at five, ten, twenty k a month scale all the way to fifty, a hundred k a month. Um, but I do it in a way that's completely different from everyone else. So mm -hmm. everyone else focuses, at least in the industry, um, focuses on appointments, 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 appointments. Mm -hmm. I need more appointments. Mm -hmm. I need 100 appointments a year or 100 mm -hmm. appointments a month. And it's like, well, bro, first of all, we're shutting down music. I scaled my agency to 50K a month, whereas five clients were doing 80% of our revenue, mm -hmm. right? Whereas uh, we had like 25 clients. The other 20 clients were just... We're just there. We had a project with them once in a while. But how you scale in my eyes and the, the most sustainable way to, to truly scale an agency is not to book a million appointments a month. You only need five or 10 appointments a month. Bring in one to two high quality clients every single month and have your deal size be 50K, 100K, 200K. And that's the easiest, most sustainable way to scale. And also you want to make sure you're getting results for every single client, getting great results, obviously, so they stay on. You have a high LTV. So that's what I teach people how to do and mm. old email and through systems, bro. So I built over 300 systems and shut down music. And that's what took me. I was stuck at 10, 15K for a, like about a year or two. That's what took me to, to 50K within 12 months. It mm. was the systems. It was the processes. It was hiring these A players and really mm. scaling up that way. So that's the same shit I did with shut down music. The same shit I used to scale is what I teach people how to do. And it's mm. been working. So... Mm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that, that was the one thing um, I always got from your content. You're big on this idea of Fortune 500 um, systems. So you said you were stuck at, you know, 10, 15K. When did you realize like systems was your issue? How did you go about learning about it? And then you said you had 300 systems. Like, how do you, where are you building that? Talk, talk to us about systems. Dude, a thousand percent. So 
Dude, I was stuck with shut down music. Um, this was probably 2017, 2018. I was living in Thailand at the time. I lost like $127,000 in crypto at the time. Um, and I wow. thought I hit the pinnacle with shut down music, right? Mm -hmm. I thought 10, 15K, we cannot scale this thing further. Maybe 20, 25K, the royalties were going to keep increasing no matter what, mm -hmm. right? Um, until I read a book called Built to Sell by John Warlow, I think is the name. Right. I read that book and then I listened to a podcast by Naval Ravikant. You know Naval? Ah, oh, it's his name sounds familiar. Okay. N-A-V-L space R-A-V-I-K-A-N-T. He's like the Silicon Valley um angel investor, philosopher type mm. of guy. Incredibly smart. He has to be over 150 IQ. And I listened to a podcast he did, and he's like, if you are in an industry, right? At that point, I was in music for seven years since I was 14. I was 21, 22. If you're, or I was maybe, maybe 20, 21. If you're in an industry for that long, you, before you switch industries, right? Mm -hmm. Before you, um, before you switch industries, before you try something else, mm -hmm. you need to juice everything you possibly can out of that industry. You built up all these relationships you have. You built up all this trust, all this knowledge. If you switch industries, you're going to need to rebuild absolutely everything, right? Mm -hmm. So that like, made me think like, whoa, that blew my mind. Like, okay, maybe I could take this shutdown thing further. And then that combined with Built to Sell by John Warlow, which basically taught you how to build bare bone systems mm -hmm. and taught you how important they are in terms of selling your agency. Um, at the end of the day, in terms of building something very like efficient and scaling up, those two things really gave me a mindset shift. And I was like, all right, fuck everything else, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is a PG show or not. Mm, nah, go ahead. <laughs> Who gives a shit? It's Facebook. Um, right. That really gave me, the, gave me the mindset shift to be like, okay, cool. Let me invest all my money and time into shutdown music. Let me scale this thing up. Let me build systems. Let me hire an A team. And then within 12 months, I had over 300 systems. I was at 50K a month. We won three to, I think, maybe two, three awards at the time with, you know, in that 12 month span. Um, and we were killing it. So that really transformed everything for me. Mm. So. Um, I heard you mention royalties a few times and then uh, just increasing the LTV per client. So um, actually, like I had an agency called Expert Funnel Incubator. And then like it was the way we had it, had it structured. It just like it, it was the problems a lot of your you know students probably go through and most agencies go through. It was just like it's just not enough. It's just like you got to either take on a bunch more clients or you got to like structure your deals different and your whole model. So uh, that's when this whole idea of like what I call equity funnels, which is not like taking equity in the company, but a percentage of sales from every funnel you built um, came about. Um, so that's kind of like the new model I'm running with. So with you, what's interesting is you did it in the music industry. So royalties are like one of those things that um, are, I guess you could say are unique to the music industry where it's like, it's like the ideal place you want to get to, right? You don't want to have to keep pumping out songs. You want royalties. So how how do you go about taking royalties from your like clients? So here's the business model, right? We were a music factory and we made the best music in the music for media industry. The best, sorry, mm -hmm. the best modern music. So shit like classical, rock, jazz, um, quirky music, like cheesy music, whatever. Um, we didn't do that. We did hip hop, pop, electro, R and B, the shit that I like, the shit that mm -hmm. I grew up with. I was mm -hmm. good at producing. I was good at executive producing. We eventually made that. Um, so basically, we made as much high quality music as possible. And mm -hmm. we had clients like Warner Chapel Production Music, Red Bull, Red Bull Sound Supply, Universal um, Production Music, um, Sony, BMG, all the big labels, and then probably 15 to 20 independent labels mm -hmm. that we made the music. We sold it to them, right? So mm -hmm. they bought it from us. They paid us from anywhere from $100, maybe $200, the low end to $1,500 per song up front. They mm -hmm. bought the song. We sold them the rights, right? It was their song now. They bought out half the royalties. So mm -hmm. in, in music, there's royalties. There's a 50-50 split. 50% oh, yeah. goes to the publisher, whoever oh, yeah. publishes and, and um, sells the music, right? 50% goes to the writers, whoever made the music. So we sold the music. Now, whoever we sold it to, now they have the publisher share of the royalties. So they have 50%. Mm -hmm. And then me, along with our musicians, shared the writer's share, mm -hmm. right? So we sold it to them. They paid us up front $200 to $1,500 a song, mostly around $500 to $1,000 on average, um, the median, right? 
And then they took that music and they put it, they, their clients were TV studio or TV um, production companies. Their clients were video game companies. Their clients were movie studios. Their clients were ad agencies. And they always, pro they always got emails. Hey, I'm looking for a song that's like Amigos, Bad and Bougie. Do you mm -hmm. guys have anything that's like that? Right? So our music kept getting pitched and pitched and pitched and pitched. And since it was the best hip hop and pop in the industry, mm -hmm. it got placed over and over and over and over again in pretty much every major TV network in the US, pretty much every major TV network really around the world. Um, tons of TV shows, tons of video games, tons of movies. Um, to give you an idea, my last royalty statement was about 250 pages. And each page probably includes 50 to 100 different places our music was in. So if you wow. do quick math on that, that's over a three month time period. So it's like 10, 20,000 placements mm -hmm. um, uh, every three months or so. Mm -hmm. That was a business model. So we mm -hmm. sold the music to them. They paid us up front. And then on the back end, we made these royalties. And on the back end, as long as the music keeps getting played on TV, radio, commercials, whatever, we'll still, I'll still keep making money. And so will the musicians that, you know, made the, that help us make the music um, mm -hmm. that we sell. Mm -hmm. I, lo I love that. Like er everyone eats, right? I'm, I'm big on uh, win-win situations. I love that the musicians and that everyone eats in that. So you're making, you're making songs. You're not like making just beats. Cause I know like. Oh. Just... So, oh, okay. so probably okay. half the music we made was instrumental, but where we really had a huge competitive advantage mm -hmm. is we found like rappers and singers that were so good, like so mm -hmm. talented. I'm talking like at a commercial level and we were able to hire them and have that and make music. So we were able to make commercial quality music for about five to six hundred dollars a song, mm -hmm. right? Whereas if you look at Drake or Migos, whatever, they're spending 20, 30 grand to make a commercial mm -hmm. song. But our music was 98 percent of the quality theirs was for 500 bucks. Right. So that's where our huge competitive advantage was. And a big piece of that was obviously the, the singers and rappers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I I love that you're in the music industry because you know again I, like before I said in the uh, before before the interview started I talked about how um, I don't know if you're used to seeing what I'm used to seeing a bunch of people who are have agencies around helping coaches and consultants and again it's like whatever you charge them X amount of dollars for whatever period of time no sort of revenue share no like seeing your way out it's like you just got to keep on taking more and more clients so it's like a day I, job basically. Uh, at that point. Mm. Yeah. So like, how did you end up uh, being in the music? I don't know if I asked this. Like, How did you end up being in the music industry for your agency? Ooh, dude, I'm 24. Mm. When I was six, my dad shouldn't have done this. I guess, you know, he introduced me into hip hop. And then ever uh, since then, I was um, I had a CD player. And um, I know I had Eminem Curtain Call. I had Lil Bow Wow. I had Buster Rhymes. I had Nelly uh, Sweat, Outkast, Stankonia. All these like uh, hip. I don't know if you're familiar with any of these. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Antonio was my shit, bro. Like Bob, uh, Miss Jackson, uh -huh. so fresh, so clean. Anyways, um, I used to play that on my CD player all the time, and I was nice. always into hip hop. Like since I was a young kid, since I was six, right? Um, so then when I was 13, 14, I started. I what was first? I joined an underground hip hop forum. I was heavily into like lyrical conscious underground hip hop. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. And then I started a hip hop blog called Dungeons of Rap. Mm -hmm. Right. And I ran that for six months. I interviewed some pretty famous underground rappers, people like Master Ace, who's Eminem's idol, actually. People like um, Dice Raw from The Roots, um, a couple other known guys, not mainstream known guys. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't make any money from that. I made $20 in six months and I didn't even. Mm -hmm take the money out of Google AdSense because I had to submit ID verification shit. Mm -hmm. I was like 14. I was like, fuck this shit. All for 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. Stopped doing that. And then some people on the forum I was on, it was on Yahoo Answers, started producing music. And I was like, whoa, you can actually produce. You don't have to just listen to it. You can make it. Mm -hmm. So I downloaded FL Studio, which is like this uh, digital audio workstation, primarily used for hip hop, actually, um, where you actually make music on. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love, bro. So like the, the first day, I think... I downloaded it. I sampled a Teddy Pendergrass song. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know Teddy Pendergrass, but yeah. OG soul guy back in uh, the 60s, 70s, him, Marvin Gaye, um, sampled him and fell in love with it. And that actually was May 5th, 2012, when I downloaded FL Studio. And mm -hmm. since then, it's, you know, it was go time. I fell in love with it. And that's what I kept doing for, for eight and a half, nine years. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, for me, uh, so I'm African. So a lot of the, what I listened to was like, you know, music, music in Africa and then a lot, a lot of reggae. So when I started, when I started listening to rap more, it was like 
2K17. That was when I graduated. I'm 23, so it was around like 2K17. So it's like I'm familiar with some old school, but not completely. So yeah. it's like, yeah. yeah. But, but where you, you at? Know, Africa is a big place. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. Where um, Where are you at in Africa? Oh, you oh, asked the question. Oh, shit. I thought you yeah. said something else. Um, Ghana. Ghana. Dude, no, man. Ghana, I'm Israeli. Ghana and Israel. I remember Ghana, uh, like they were in the World Cup in 04, and I, I think uh, and, like they scored a goal and someone put on an Israeli flag. Uh, I think. Oh wow! Yeah, I, I didn't see that. From from the last time I watched uh, soccer, this is this is totally going left field. <laughs> the last time I watched soccer, oh, yeah. uh, it was uh, I get it was against Uruguay, and then I was like, they had cheated, and then we had lost, and it was it was terrible. They cheated on anyway. you? Yeah, yeah, it was you like. Not on you, but... Yeah, yeah, one of the players they were um they were they were playing the goalie and they were using their hands to block the ball and it was we should have won but it, it was crazy. So I know, right? So okay, we talked about how you found your industry. We talked about um your offer. Now let's talk about like you're, you're big on cold email, right? So when when it, how do you do cold email? Like I've never that's never been something I tried. Um, why are you so big on it? How did you discover it? Et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm so big on it. I think it's the easiest and most, pre- I mean, I don't know how you define easy, but it's pretty simple once you understand it, once you understand how to do it. And it's incredibly predictable and you can get like more so than Facebook ads, more so than SEO. You can really target who you, who you get on a call with mm-hmm. right? very, very well. So it's like, you're not going to hop on calls with anyone that's unqualified if you do it right. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause you literally choose every single person that you email. Mm. Right. You literally go and get their email, put it in your um, put it in your spreadsheet or whatever. How you do cold email is man, there's a lot, there's a lot to cover. Here. This I don't know how long this do you want this interview to be. I mean, uh, generally like an hour, so we're we're like 17, okay. so you can go I'll ahead. I'll give you a short little framework. So yeah. basically, what you want to do from a prospect's perspective, right? They're getting email. So the first thing you want to do is captivate their attention. You want them to actually click on your email. Okay, how do you do that? You have a subject line that looks like it's not automated, that looks like it's not salesy, right? That looks, that invokes curiosity, right? Subject lines like quick question are really good or question Mm. for first name are really Mm. good or quick Q or Q or just first name and a question mark, right? Invoke curiosity, get them to click. Mm -hmm. Now the next thing you want them to do is basically when they click on your email, you want to show them, hey, I actually did a little bit of research on you. And by the way, this email is not automated. It's completely manual. Mm -hmm. I did research on you specifically. I um, found you, your website, your company, whatever I know of you from someplace. And I believe in my, I believe that I can help you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can help you, not your niche, not your market, you as one single person, right? So to do that, Typically, you want to have a greeting. So, hey, name or hi, name. You can also just say name. You Mm -hmm. can also switch it up, right? Don't be too formal. Don't say hello, name. Don't say dear sir, dear madam. That's just incredibly socially uncalibrated. Mm -hmm. Um, And then what you want to do is you want to have a personalized first line, right? So this is something that you say. It's it's typically a compliment you give them, right, Um, about a product that they have or a case Mm -hmm. study that they have or certain results or a blog post that they wrote, or a podcast interview that they did, or whatever, you point something specific out, and then you give them a compliment, and you attach some kind of critical thought to it, Mm -hmm. right? To where that line that you just wrote, you cannot take that line and send it to any other prospect, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? So once someone reads that line, they know, okay, this person obviously did their Mm -hmm. research, they checked out this piece of content, or this product, or this case study, whatever, Okay, cool. Now I want to take them seriously because they're emailing me one-to-one, right? Next, what you want to do is foreshadow value. So what can you say quickly and concisely? Obviously, this email is not a thousand words, right? You want to keep it typically under 50 to 75 words for your first email. And then obviously you want to follow up five, 10 times. Um, Foreshadow value. So you want to write something that makes the prospect think, wow, this person Mm -hmm. can potentially add a lot of value to my life. Mm -hmm. Right. If you don't do that, they're not going to respond to you. Why the hell would they respond? It's always a what's in it for me game. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have to foreshadow a shit ton of value, not value like, oh, I could um, solve a 
problem that you're not even thinking about or a problem that's not going to make a, a big effect on your bottom line. Sure. But you want to solve big, annoying, um, head-banging problems, right? You want to sure. foreshadow you solving a bleeding neck problem, sure. right? That's the term of phrase by Dan Kennedy, which means like you need to solve a problem now and you're willing to pay a shit ton of money to solve it. Sure. You do that. You have a, some kind of CTA and basically you want to get them on a phone call. Mm -hmm. That's your goal, right? You want to start a conversation actually, right? Start a conversation and get them on a phone call. And if you're able to do that um, at a high level, if you know how to cold email at a high level, you can get pretty easily a anywhere from a 1% to a 3 4% call book rate, which means if you email 100 prospects, you're going to be booking, you know, one, four calls, mm -hmm. right? And if you look at the math, if you have a high deal size, that's at least 10K a month, if not 25, 50, 100K a month, it's incredibly high ROI because it really doesn't take much time to, first of all, get the leads, right? The list of people you want to email, write the cold email sequences, personalize them a little bit and put them in some kind of cold automate, cold email automation platform like QuickMail or like Lemlist and get them off. So it's incredibly highly efficient level of client acquisition. Mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. and you don't do anything with social media because i know you wanted to talk a little bit about personal branding i do i do or at least at least at least for uh shutdown music to be more specific with shutdown music we got clients just through cold email we did have an instagram page maybe two three years into it i did open up an instagram page just to have that social proof online because a lot of the time we hit up artists right mm -hmm. like Oh, shut down music. How you're there's so much skepticism in the music mm, industry. You're like, yeah. how can I tell? Maybe you're just lying to me. You're taking yeah. advantage of musicians, or how do I know you really worked with these people? Mm -hmm. It's like, bro, really? Let me just create this fucking Instagram mm -hmm. page and just send you there. And since then, we never had any issues with that. Um, but we really just got clients off cold email, shut down music. Yeah. Mm. So um, and, uh, one thing I got from what you were saying with how you structure cold emails is use, use, use a, a framework that kind of really works in every medium, whether it's written word, audio, video, Facebook, Instagram, um, Russell Brunson talks about a hook story offer, right? Um, I've been super big on like teaching people and like shouting at the top of my lungs that you need to focus on frameworks because, um, yeah, it really doesn't matter what medium you use. Like it's a cold outreach on Messenger. S same, same idea, same frameworks. Um, and you also mentioned mentioned Dan Kennedy. How how much do you study um like the old school marketers? Dude, before November 2020, when I disbanded my music agency and I started mm. going like hard on Twitter, growing my personal brand, mm. um, I did not know a lick about. Mm traditional marketing and funnels and offers and i mean obviously i knew about offers because i had an mm, offer mm. and i knew about cold email and systems and hiring and, and client relations and all the stuff that i teach now but the more traditional direct response marketing world mm. i literally knew nothing about mm -hmm. nothing not a fucking lick mm -hmm. um so this is all brand new to me really and i've been getting heavily into it in the past probably th three to four months when Two months ago, I got into nothing held back. I joined Fast yeah. Forward as well. Um, I've been binging the calls. I Obviously, Alan Sultanich. Sultanich? I think it's Sultanic. Sultanic? <laughs> I think so. I think yeah. so. Okay. Um, yeah, just been getting into that. Been reading a lot of books. Um, so I haven't really been in that world as much as maybe you have, I would mm -hmm. assume. And other people in our space um, and on Facebook have been, I've been in my own little world for, mm. for 95% of my career. Mm. And I I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, I was watching a video by Alex Hermosi and he was talking about how, like he had, was already making a shitload of money before he even started reading the marketing books, sales books. And, you know, you, you were crushing it before you had to know all that stuff. And even though you may have been applying, I was reading stuff, books, don't get me wrong. I was right, reading books, but they right, weren't like right. direct response marketing books. Right, right, right. right. Um, but you had learned, you were using a lot of the direct response marketing principles. Um, and you were learning that just from experience, right. Or not just from experience, but probably mo mainly from experience. Mostly. Uh, so, um, it just, it just goes to show that, you know, t take action. Cause I know, um, pe people just overthink everything just in general, like, Oh, before I got to go to the gym, I got to get the wristbands and I got to get a workout uh, plan and everything. 
And um, like I even have, you know, some people I'm working with and talking to now and they just overthink the fuck out of everything before they take action. When if you just uh, you just did, you can start to see some results. So, um, so let, me, yeah. let me tell you something about that. That is a huge issue for me. Mm. On some shit, I just overthink to the max. On some mm. shit, I take action and go. Um, for example, the take for an example of a take action and go um, mm. side of things. I started my Twitter account. Well, I started on Twitter in 2009, but I didn't do anything mm. um, when I was like 11 or 12. Mm. I didn't do anything in terms of business until November, late November. So after Thanksgiving 2020. Mm. And I literally just said, fuck it. Let me just go hard on Twitter. I got 3 million impressions my first month. I had 1,500 followers. Wow. I had 3 million impressions my first month. Every month after that was 6 million impressions or more. And I grew by two to three, two, two to 3,000 followers every month. June 2021, it was like 4,500. I discovered a couple of things that make growth go crazy. Um, mm. All organic followers. I built an email list of 6,200 people. So obviously they were converting. I made over $250,000 in revenue in that 12 month span um that i was on twitter mm. and um yeah my first month i did three million impressions and i didn't know shit i didn't take mm. any courses on how to grow on twitter i didn't really know what a personal brand even was mm. really um i didn't follow anyone i did follow people with personal brands but i didn't do any studying i mm. didn't do shit. i just said let me just go and add a shit ton of value on twitter and see where it goes and i got three mm. million impressions my first month that's mm -hmm. it wow yeah, yeah tell me a little bit more about Twitter because I've been, I, you know, I hear about Twitter from time to time. I used to use Twitter. I was heavy on it. Even now, I do kind of use it just to kind of uh, make quick posts like a screenshot. Um, but I actually want to go harder on it because I, I remember um, my friend, he owns a company called Thread Apps uh, NFT Marketplace. Um, he's killing it right now. But he, he was like his first like come up was like on Twitter. He had like made like 50 grand in a day or something with an offer. Um, and, you know, with Twitter, it's like it's all super short form content. So, like, what, what exactly are you posting on Twitter? Um, yeah, what, what was your strategy for growth and how, how did you do what you did? Yeah, what well, it's it is 280 characters mm. for a tweet. But what you can do is you could write a thread. Right. And right. basically a thread of a shit. And that's that's actually a big thing that I used to grow to really demonstrate my value. And it's mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. post that I put in NHB, right? So it's like mm -hmm. these longer form posts where they're incredibly fucking actionable mm -hmm. where I tell you, Hey, step by step, mm -hmm. here is what you do to get X result. And I did that on Twitter and I put out probably five or six threads a month. So a little more than one a week. Mm -hmm. That was a big growth strategy of mine. Um, <clears throat> what else did I do? I became friends with a lot of big accounts in my niche. Mm -hmm. That's an absolute bare minimum must mm -hmm. you need to become friends with big accounts in your niche because mm -hmm. they're going to, they're going to engage with your stuff. It's mm -hmm. not just, it's likes and replies actually that get you a shit ton of impressions from them, mm -hmm. right? So if they like and reply something, their audience sees it. Oh, Ty Frankel just liked this tweet. And mm -hmm. then they see that tweet and then they're like, whoa, that's a great tweet. That makes me curious in this person. Wow. Let me click the profile. Boom. Oh, they have a great profile that, that foreshadows them adding a lot of value to my life. Boom, let me follow them, right? So that's kind of how the funnel works. Mm -hmm. um, becoming friends with big accounts in your niche writing a uh, really valuable threads, knowing how to write, bro. Like, I guess me just since 2012, I had a hip hop blog in 2012, right? I was 14. Mm -hmm. I've been emailing since 2012, obviously to get those interviews and to sell my beats since 2012, mm -hmm. right? Um, and eventually to get these big clients and all that. So I know how to write. Um, you need to like write very concise. One of my things I do is I'm high energy. Mm -hmm. um, I have my own writing style. So a lot of the times mm -hmm. I capitalize some words a lot of the time, sometimes I misspell a word on purpose and that's just how I write it, mm -hmm. right? So you know it's me. In my eyes, someone should be able to read your post, not have any profile picture, not have any name, but they should know it's you. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big thing that I did. I like that. What else? I tweeted five to seven times a day. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing that I did. Um, I tweeted every tweet that I had was about one to two hours, at least one hour apart. So you didn't overwhelm the algorithm. That's another thing I did. Um, I made my bio very um, prospect facing. So if someone read it, it was directed to you, right? And it wasn't a, about me and what I do and this. Yeah. It was like, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. For example, my LinkedIn bio right now is follow me to grow your agency to 100K a month. Okay, I love cool. that. I love that. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was good. Um, what else did I do on Twitter? Uh, 
Um, I think those were the main strategies. Oh yeah, I, I, me and a couple of friends pioneered this strategy last summer, 2021, mm. where we put out free resources on Twitter, and then we asked people, hey, reply to this mm. to resource. And I, you know, we we pioneered it on Twitter. I assume it was on other platforms before. Yeah, it, it, it was. It used to be popular on Facebook and like a little community. It still works, but it just, uh, I guess, in the internet marketing community, it doesn't really work as well. Yeah. Dude, on Twitter, at least it's been killing yeah. for the past year plus. Um, and the first time I did that in June, actually, last year, mm-hmm. um, June last year, I got 2,500 responses. So I built this niche master list of 242. It was 191 niches and 51 services you can provide them. I put out the tweet. It got 2,500 responses. It got like 1,300 new followers mm-hmm. and like 1,500 new people into my email list in 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, like, this is that's insane. That's crazy. So then, yeah, I started doing that a little more. And now that strategy is gone. Fuck it. Like, everyone does that shit. Um, mm-hmm. So those are like six or seven things you could do to, to really kill it on Twitter. But at the end of the day, you need to add a fuck ton of value. Mm-hmm. And I didn't create my Twitter when I was 14, when I was just starting. I created my Twitter when I was 20. It was November 2020. So it must have been I was 23. And I've already built an agency to 50K a month. Mm-hmm. I already worked with you. I already signed a joint venture label deal with Universal Music. I already built my, you know, won four awards and worked with G Herbo mm-hmm. and, and accomplished all this shit. Mm-hmm. So now I could really come from a place of true authority mm-hmm. teaching how to do something. I didn't just fucking start something. And, you know, although mm-hmm. you can't do that and you can definitely build in public, but it's a, it's a completely right. different strategy. Yeah, you can you can build um in public like you said you can uh, document the process right the reason um your content works the reason it hits the reason people even pay attention to what you say um is because of your story right people don't care about your story until you've made it but even in, in building um your your that's pretty much your story like you're literally showing the story in real time rather than telling it after the fact so um I made I made a I actually made a post about that where. Um, I said it's really easy to create content when you're you're doing your thing and you're actually like you're, you're doing your thing. You're living it day by day and you're not trying to like make up fake characters and fake stories. It's, it's very easy to just like dump your thoughts on a, a you know, a, on on your a screen. Right. Um, so I want to talk a little bit and, you know, again, uh, frameworks. Right. Like the same idea with Twitter staying consistent, the whole um asking people hey comment all that little stuff works on other platforms too um it does like social proof for example um is is why that works and yeah i'm I'm so big on frameworks now um let's talk a little bit more about your conversations when you oh actually i want to go backtrack there was something you brought up that i actually have been big on recently which is the uh, idea of advocates right so leveraging somebody else's authority leveraging somebody else's audience to grow yours and you said you did that on twitter um, and when you are starting out, you can do like interviews, for example, to leverage other people's authority to build yours uh, and build your following. So that was something very interesting. So I want to uh, back up and talk a little bit more about uh, your sales process when you were closing clients. Like how how, how many calls were you doing? Um, how did you structure your calls? I want to talk a little more about that. I didn't do much calls. I didn't do many uh-huh. calls. Um, okay. And I'll tell you why. So and this is what I teach people how to do as well. Mm-hmm. If your offer is the best offer in the market, mm-hmm. you're not going to have a tough time finding clients. Mm-hmm. You're not going to have a tough time finding the best clients. And you're not going to have a tough time trying to scale. Mm-hmm. You're only going to have a tough time trying to scale is if you have an offer that's not top 1%. Right. Mm-hmm. So my advice before you do anything else, get really damn good at what you do. Mm-hmm. If you're not really good at what you do and you're not getting clients, look yourself in the mirror and and really analyze yourself and ask yourself, hey, am I top 1% in this market mm-hmm. in terms of skill set? If not, then improve your skill set, then go out and get clients, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe as, an agency, as a freelancer, sure, bring on clients. Um, <clears throat> but we had the best offer in the market. We made the mm-hmm. hands down objectively, like from, from my ear as a producer for four and a half years, an executive producer for for what, three and a half, four and a half years or so, nine years total in the music game. Um, we had objectively the best mu- modern music for media in the industry. So when I went out and I cold emailed Universal and Warner and Red Bull, listen, they might have not responded on the first email. They might have not responded on the second email. But I knew that as soon as they listened to the music, aka as soon as they took a look at your offer, right? Let's say you're selling mm-hmm. the offer. 
they'd fucking fall in love with it and we would end up working together. So that's what happened. And I didn't need to jump on calls because our offer was literally the music we made. So all I did was obviously send them a cold email using the framework that I use now, um, personalize all that good stuff. And I included a link to a box folder, right? Mm -hmm. And that box folder included recent music that we just did, right? Or maybe it included recent placements that we just got, some big placements with Mercedes Benz or Ford or Doja Cat or Fortnite or NBA 2K. Um, and I included that. And eventually I emailed enough people at the company or I emailed enough, um, same person in, in enough times. Eventually they listened to the goddamn music finally. And um, they got back to me and we ended up working together. And funny thing is, I probably only had 25, 30 prospects mm -hmm. in the whole industry. And I ended up working with every single person that I wanted to work with because our offer was just that good. And I was just mm -hmm. that relentless when I was cold emailing. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. And you, uh, your results kind of spoke for itself too. That kind of um, helped you too, like uh, the people you had worked with, all that. Um, now, God, there was there was something that was on the. It was a question I had. G Herbo. Well, we, we can talk about G Herbo, but oh man, it was it was it was really important to. Anyway, let, let's talk about G Herbo. Okay. How did you end up working with G Herbo? <laughs> oh, I uh, so in twenty. 13 2012 13 i was like that guy that had what's the term called not unabashed confidence but like i believed in myself so much that i thought i was up here right well, maybe the camera can see it but i was really down here in terms of skill set as a producer and i'm still like that i still have insane belief in myself and i was like dude these beats i'm making are hot bro i was like 15 16 and it's like they were trash you can't be it like it takes seven to eight years to become a commercial level producer mm. right um and you have to do it every day it's like not even ten thousand hours it's more like 15 20 thousand mm. because there's so many little skill sets and like sub skill sets that you have to master anyways i used to send my beats out to fucking everybody in the industry bro everyone got my beats everybody <laughs> like I, I i'd recently um hopped in my old email address and i saw beats from like 2013 that i was sending to travis scott and uh, Janae Iko. Mm -hmm. So that's as far back as I was sending them. Wow. And one day I was working with this rapper. Fuck, what's his name? Uh, he wasn't that good, but he used to pay me for my beat. <laughs> he used to pay me about a buck 50 for a beat. Right. And I was 15, so I was happy, 15, 16. And um, he, I guess he listened to the G Herbo mixtape. Mm -hmm. And he's like, bro, I heard your tag on the mixtape. Like, is this yeah. you? And he's he sent me the link to the mixtape. It was called um, "Welcome to Phaso Land," right? I think. Oh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, and then he sent me like the song was called "Love to Stunt," and I listened uh, to it. And as soon as I played, I'm like, "What the fuck, bro? Like this is this is my beat. Like this is crazy. Like wow. I was like jumping up and down in the room and shit. I was so happy. And then it set in. I'm like, I should be getting paid for this shit. Uh -huh. Okay, so let me let me go out and let me email. Um, G Herb and like kind of like what the fuck like why didn't they even tell me right so i was kind of mad like i was kind of happy and mad. Yeah, it was like yeah, yeah. Emotions, right um so then i went emailed uh, mikey halstead um g herbo's producer um, g herbo's mm. manager at the time and um he got he got back to me like yeah bro da -da -da, we used your beat whatever i'm like why the fuck would you use this low quality version i sent him like low like 128 mm. kilobyte per second versions of the beat mm. which if you know anything about like the quality of like audio files it's fucking mm. super low quality and they used that on the mixtape. And I'm like, mm -hmm. bro, you could have just hit me up. I would have sent you the high right. quality. Anyways, we signed a deal that, that would have them paying me $250, right? And I'm fucking air. Then I'm like, hell yeah. Like I'm 15, 16. Like I'm so excited, whatever. Signed the deal, bro. I literally like had to go to fucking Staples and get the fucking contract right. printed out and fucking sign it and scan it and all this shit. So I ended up doing that and I sent it back to them. And then, bro, they fucking ghost me. Wow. For weeks. And I keep hitting them back like, Mikey, yo, like, I signed the contract. Da, 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 here it is. Like, could you please reply? Whatever. Anyways, they don't reply. After about, I don't remember exactly how long it was, but maybe a month or two or something like that. I probably sent four or five email follow-ups. They didn't reply. Um, I was like, fuck it. What can I do to actually get paid mm -hmm. of Love to Stunt, the song I produced for Herbo, right? Um, let me register it to BMI, which is... I think America's largest royalty collection platform, right? There's BMI and ASCAP. Those are the two big ones. Um, all the artists that you know, that you love, Jay-Z, Kanye, Ariana Grande, Justin Bieber, are signed up to either BMI or ASCAP. 
and I registered it with BMI and I put myself, you know, I, I don't think Herbo's going to see this. If he does, well, you stole my beat anyway, so you kind of deserve it. Um, <laughs> I registered the song as 100% me. <laughs> uh -huh. BMI. So I registered uh -huh. Yeah, I'm like, fuck you, bro. Like, you didn't fucking, like, we signed the yeah, story, yeah, and yeah. we signed the contract, and you didn't right. pay me, bro. So, like, right. that's some that's some bullshit. I'm, I'm yeah. 16. Let me get this money. Mm -hmm. So I registered the song, Love This Song, as 100% me. I owned 100% of the mm -hmm. song. And shit, since then, I made, like, 4 or 5K off it in royalties. Nice. So in the end, I got paid. He's still got paid. Boys. I'm sure Herbo isn't like. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure he's made a lot. <laughs> he's made a lot more for the other songs. That's dope. That that was actually one of my. I think that, that might have been an album that put me on to D Herbo. That's mm -hmm. dope. That's crazy, man. And that, my question came back to me. So, um, I wanted to know: Do you feel like it's supposed to be hard to build an agency? Because you know, you said your offer sold itself. Um, you know, your, your, how, how you reached out to clients and got clients was super simple. You didn't have to do all the, uh, you know, crazy sales calls. So do you believe it's supposed to be hard? Cause some people like I'm sure are struggling to get clients and it's probably because of those things, their offer sucks, all that. So what does hard mean? Like if you're retired, wait, <laughs> if you're, if you're not that smart, uh, like if you're under hundred IQ, like, yes, it's going to be hard. But if you <laughs> And I'm sorry, but like it might not right. be PPC. And I was about to say the R word, but like you can't take a dog and have, you know what I mean? Like IQ matters at some point. Um, <laughs> so you can't be stupid. If you're smart, like if you're highly competent, if you have a good work ethic, if you know how to discern good information from bad information, if you follow people like me and Desmond, right? Um, and you uh -huh. consume the right shit and you're an avid reader and you're an avid, not just reader but you take knowledge and you apply it right so knowledge is worthless until it's applied knowledge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you do that and you're patient um and you try to master a skill set before you even really start of even think of creating a whole agency around it mm -hmm. um you're gonna do well and it is gonna be simple for you right but if you don't have those things it is gonna be hard or maybe even nearly impossible for you so it depends on the situation. I mean, I'm a guy that I simplify a lot of shit, but then I overcomplicate a lot of other shit. Um, <laughs> but if you, you, there is a way to overcomplicate it. So many people are. Mm. I know for a fact to get from zero to 10K a month, it's incredibly fucking simple. Mm -hmm. It's 100 emails a day for two months. Get, just craft a great offer that you make at least $25,000 LTV, right? Um, email 100 people or not 100 people a day. Do email sequences, four emails to 750 prospects a month, right? That's 3,000 emails a month, 100 a day. Um, within two months, you're going to have five, six clients paying you at least two, $3,000 a month. Easy. You don't need a logo. You really don't even need a website, bro. Mm -hmm. um, a great offer, a great niche that's willing to pay for it, 100 cold emails a day. Boom. Stop overcomplicating it. As soon as you hit 10K a month, okay, now start to build systems. Now start to automate. Now start to hire. Now build a website. Right, but to get from zero to 10k a month, keep it simple, simple. Um, and you will just you're gonna find success a lot quicker, basically. Nice, nice, nice. So, uh, well, I'm gonna talk more about the agency coaching business and how that's treating you and what you're seeing in the space. But, um, before one last question about the uh shutdown music, so how big was your team? I know you probably work with a lot more contractors, but like your core team, how big was that, and who was in it at the end of the day? Everyone was a contractor, okay. U2s. Um, we did have seven, I think eight in-house employees. So I had an AR, had a production coordinator, had a um, head of admin, a couple admin assistants. Um, who else? A couple managers, I think. A couple, whatever. Eight in-house people, right? This is my team. And then we had a team of like 70 artists. Mm -hmm. So we had producers from around the world. Actually, a big stronghold of producers for us were from Eastern Europe because mm -hmm. Romania, Russia, Ukraine. I actually have a couple of guys in Ukraine right now that I'm um, even helped out, sent some money to just to going through a tough time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we had about 70 artists and eight in-house employees. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. So now um, agency coaching space, what what made you um, get into teaching other agencies? Uh, do you have a passion? Were you seeing something in the industry you didn't like? What made you get into the space? So with the music business, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much bullshit. There's so many like, mm -hmm. 
so many like just politics behind your back gossip it's there's a lot of resistance also to making money it's like making 50k a month in music is like making two 300k a month in any other marketing agency Mm -hmm. it's it's just fucking really really hard Mm -hmm. and that's a big reason why we had no competition right Mm because no one was i wouldn't say stupid enough because music was all i knew so i was like this was kind of grew into this very organically um but if you're gonna if you're gonna choose any niche, don't choose music. Let me just yeah, like I I do want to just say like I I know a lot of friends who are like uh, artists and like I always try to give them some game around like dude, you can sell a service. Like I know a dude um he, uh, he was interviewed by Dan Henry who's who's I, I think he's doing seven figures or multiple six figures per year just like um doing music videos for companies because like I know like I think per stream you're only getting like a penny so just to to make like 10 grand a month as an artist you got to be doing a million streams uh, consecutively like on average i might be wrong about i think a million streams on spotify is four thousand (laughs) dollars even worse (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah, it's like there's so much more profitable ways to make money in the music industry but like take those same talents and skills and make it in a, another industry. Yeah. Um, even like some marketers, like they market to other marketers when they could like find other people who would, you know, happily pay you whatever price, pay you for your products and services. And it's a lot more, uh, less resistant. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you continue. Right. Yeah. Dude, exactly. Right. And there's actually different levels to the music industry. So the, mu- mm. the commercial music industry where most producers or most rappers or most singers or mostly everybody, is trying to get into is absolutely the most crowded subsect mm. of the music industry. And it might be one of the biggest subsects, if not the biggest, um, but that's the most crowded. And it's like, you have incredibly talented producers producing for five, 10, 15 years, top of their game, right? Top mm. 1%, top 0.1% that are in poverty, bro. And mm. it's like, what kind of, that's why I actually got into music for TV and film. Cause it's like, I was selling my beats to rappers and mm. only 1% really gave a shit and wanted to pay for them. So what kind of business am I in that 1% of my potential clientele mm-hmm. wanted to pay for my shit? What kind of dumbass am I to stay in that business, right? Anyways, music for media was a little bit better. And then obviously other industries are a lot better. Made me get into the agency space was, it was just very organic, bro. So mm-hmm. I left, I disbanded Shut Down Music late November, 2020. I knew I was gonna make these royalties for mm-hmm. 10, 15, 20 years. I didn't have to worry about money. Um, my goal is 50 million by 30. So I did worry about money, but not in terms of a survival sense, mm-hmm. right? in terms of like um, goal oriented sense. And I was like, let me just go fucking hard on Twitter and see where it takes me. Mm-hmm. And I went hard and people fucking loved it. And I believe in my eyes, I truly created the best content on Twitter in the game. And I think my growth shows that I did in terms of the most value packed content. Mm-hmm. And that's how I got into it. So we just really eased into it in a very organic type of way. And is there anything you're seeing in the space that you like uh, don't like or turns you off by any chance? Wow. Is there anything I'm seeing? Uh, man, you'd have to give me like a Santa Claus type of list. Like, uh-huh. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't want to say names. Um, and, you know, I guess who, who am I to judge? Right. Mm. So like, really only God can judge you. I mean, even if you believe in God or not. Um, who am I to judge? But if you're making money, you're making money. And I don't hate on that. And I don't want to talk shit. Um, the thing that we spoke about before is like too many people that think appointments are the way to go. Like you mm-hmm. don't, like, like I said, you don't need to have to book 20, 30, 50 appointments a month to scale. Actually, that's the wrong way of doing it um, in my eyes, because in my business and the best agencies that I've seen that have survived for three, five, 10 years, and that I've built to multiple six figures a month, build their business on client retention. Mm-hmm. They don't build it on client acquisition. They don't really care about bringing in five, 10 new clients a month. Mm-hmm. They care about bringing in the right client that they're mm-hmm. going to make six figures from at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's about offer. It's about having that high LTV and it's about bringing in quality clients. Right. If they pay you a lot of money every month and they stay a lot of months, you're going to make a lot of money from them. And you only really need to bring in one or two new clients a month. And you're going to scale much quicker than those people who bring in. 10 new clients a month, but they all churn within three months. Mm -hmm. And that also gives you a bad name in the industry, right? And Mm -hmm. you're also probably not doing good work if they leave within three to four months. How could you even sleep at night at that point? Mm -hmm. Right? In my eyes, with Shutdown Music, we made the best product in the industry, hands Mm -hmm. down. In the agency space, whoops, 
whatever I put out, I want it to be the best in the industry, hands down. And it's like, that's what I teach people how to do. Be the fucking best at what you do. Bring in one or two clients a month. You're going to scale very, very fast if you do that, actually. Mm -hmm. Nice. So I, I like I like your confidence. I like um the way you think about like being the best and everything. So uh is, is that like kind of how you've always approached everything in life, like school, maybe you did sports, like how, how have you That's approached school. <laughs> That's school. I didn't I didn't give a shit about school. I was a yeah like I'm I'm smart. My dad mm. went to college at 13, he went to the University of Puget Sound at 16, wow. he went to Harvard. Yeah, he wow. got his PhD from um either Oxford or MIT. He went to both. My brother's 145 IQ. He was in the math Olympics in Israel. Um, I, I'm not as smart as them, but I did get a, a piece of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? mm. um, but I didn't give a shit about school. I was a B student in high mm. school. Um, this, the things I do give a shit about, I can't handle. Um, I just I just need to be the best. It's like this mm. innate drive in me that I just need to be the best. So mm. back in the day, I used to play NBA 2K a lot, mm. right? When mm. I was like 16, 17, I was like, I went on like a 35 game win streak online and like the top seed. Wow. So I was like a wow. 0.0001% player with the beats, right? With the music industry, with the songs that I made, we made the best music in the industry. Feel mm -hmm. free to look up my name on Spotify, Ty Frankel. Mm -hmm. um, you can listen to some of the music. There's a playlist I made I called Ty Frankel is the goat. Um, nice. It's on my artist profile. You can check it out. And those are like my best songs, right? That mm -hmm. are on Spotify at the least. Um, and yeah, that's always with the shit that I actually invest my time into. I try to be the best because listen, you only have one life to live. So mm -hmm. how could you not like, I don't understand. I, other people have different mindsets, have mm -hmm. different priorities. Right. But in my eyes, I can't put, I can't invest in something really, really give a shit about it and not try to be the best. My mind just is not wired that way. It never mm -hmm. has been. It never will be. Yeah, it's like um, it's like you know, go big or go home, right? It's like why why would you want to half ass it? I think it, I think it's more so just like a mindset thing. People don't really uh, feel like they can accomplish greatness. Um, I think it's also like a problem with like self esteem. I, I say like that's one of the greatest you know uh, pandemics in this world. Low self esteem. Um, people don't realize they can they can accomplish a lot. Um, and sometimes it does like some like I felt like that, but that way before too though. Actually, when I met someone that kind of like opened my mind, I saw the way he was living, and that changed everything for me. So, um, cool, cool, cool. Now, last thing. So, like, how how was your like day to day like then? Um, is it like are you like work work like Alex or Mosey sixteen hours a day or like you know how how was your day to day? Dude, I am not. <clears throat> I'm not the hardest worker. Mm -hmm. I'm not. Um, I might. I, I think I'm a very smart worker. Mm -hmm. I probably work six to eight hours a day, mm -hmm. and that's every day. So I don't. I don't take weekends off. Um, I probably take a day off every two or three weeks, and that's. I still probably work two hours on that day because mm -hmm. um, shit needs to be moved. Like if mm -hmm. you're an entrepreneur, shit. There's some shit that you just need to keep flowing, right? You mm -hmm. can never just like take a day completely off and come back. Mm -hmm. um, if you can, that's great. And and mm -hmm. and your business, you should strive to have a business like that one day. I'm not at that point yet, at least with um my current business, right? My day to day, I'm active for like four hours a day. So like, mm -hmm. there's days where I go on two mile beach runs, I walk six miles, and I play basketball for three hours, and that's just one day. There's other days where I go weight lift for an hour, go to the steam room, um, go play basketball for two hours and do beach runs or night runs or whatever. So it's like, I'm active for like three to five hours a day. It's pretty fucking crazy, mm -hmm. but I love it. Um, my body doesn't love it as much. Sometimes it gets a little sore, mm -hmm. but I'm very active. And then other times I just do work. And then something I've been, I read two books a month. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really go out like that. Like I think going out is, is, it's it kind old. of it's old, bro. And it's like if you're a guy, you're going out to get a girl, right? And it's like you can you can get girls like way higher, way higher quality girls too mm -hmm. that you actually want to be in a relationship with outside of going out. Like you mm -hmm. can meet them at the gym, or you can I go to yoga classes now at my gym, right? I go to Pilates classes at my gym. I don't do that just for the for the exercise. There's <laughs> 90%, 90% girls, and like I go to Equinox, so it's like a uh, high-end gym. Um, yeah good guys in there as well. Like guys that I might want to be friends with. Um, yeah. So a lot of just work, a lot of sitting and thinking actually, 
um, a lot of, I've been meditating lately. Um, I really like to like analyze my life and reflect on it mm -hmm. and iterate on what I can improve in terms of social situations, in terms of maybe even this interview that we did in terms of mm -hmm. um, business, um, business stuff, in terms of physical stuff, in terms of where my mindset is at. Because I think that's the only way you can improve. You can't just read or whatever. You have to actually experience and analyze and reflect and iterate mm. right, to get real improvement. And um, yeah, that's that's what my day is at. So it's like work. There's um, just being active a shit ton. Sometimes I go out with friends. Um, most of the time it's like doing something healthy, right? So I go and, mm. oh, we work two, three hours at a cafe, right? We're doing Instagram right. stuff together. Or we're, we're doing boxing lessons together, right? Mm -hmm. My good friend... Uh, Renee, we just did a boxing workout yesterday. Um, when I do stuff with friends, it's mostly like healthy, mm -hmm. right? Combined with the friendship. You know what I mean? Right. I go play basketball. I have friends. I'm, I'm going to go today, what, in three and a half hours, go play basketball with a couple of friends. So mm -hmm. that's what my day looks like. That's dope. And then last, last question, actual last question. So what is your, uh, what is your big why? <clears throat> Damn, man, my big why. Selfishly, obviously, I want to make, um, I want to just have an amazing life. Mm -hmm. Right. You have one and we're, we're in 2022. And if some disease doesn't strike me early yeah. <laughs> or something like that, right. If I live a long life, God forbid, God forbid, knock on wood. Um, I would just want to have an incredible life and I want to have an amazing family and I want to have, you know, I don't know the exact number, but at least five, if not 10 to 20 kids, they must be with the same woman. Um, wow. <laughs> wow, yeah. that's a lot. wow. And just teach them everything I know. And just, um, raise some really fucking great kids that just help the world be a better place. Um, and then also when I was little, when I was seven, my sister actually passed. Mm -hmm. um, she had a brain tumor and there was a 90% chance she'd survive. But the doctors, like if they operated on her, but the doctors like just basically she died of medical malpractice at the end of the day. And um, <clears throat> she was two and I was seven. So obviously like this really formed, this really had a big effect on me obviously, um, especially as a seven-year-old kid, right? Whereas your, your formative years. And my goal is to make enough money that if any one of my friends, if any one of my family is going through any kind of health problem, I could just be like, bro, here, take $10,000, get the best treatment possible. Let's not wait. Let's not take the chance that you might have something deadly here and that these stupid ass doctors aren't finding it for you and aren't like getting you on the right treatment or, or operating on you or getting you on the right tests or whatever. Cause that's what happened basically with my sister. Like, Oh, she'll be okay. She'll be fine. And a week later, take her back. Oh, she'll be okay. She'll be mm -hmm. fine. And that's how it happened. Eventually it was too late. So I just don't want that to happen to anyone close to me that I know um, and that I love. So I want to be able to, to make enough money to be able to provide that for the people that um, I'm close with. Yeah. yeah, if you would ask me the question, I would have said the same thing, man. Because, uh, yeah, it's, it, uh, especially in America, with, with with healthcare not being free and whatnot, and just all the bullshit we eat and the lifestyle we live, um, yeah. it, 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 things like that, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to wish that on my worst uh, enemy. But you know, in cases yeah. when it does occur, it's like uh, you want to definitely be able to provide and help uh, with stuff like that. So, um, you know, we could, we could go off for another hour, but when people, if people want to learn more from you, they want to scale their agency to hundred K a month. Um, how do they get in touch with you? Where's the best place for them to go to learn from you? Man, best place, Ty Frankel on Facebook at the Ty Frankel on Instagram. I just started my YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to put a lot of stuff on there. I have a Facebook group. Um, one it's the dollar sign one M. So like $1 million agency secrets. Um, tyfrankel.com, sign up to my email list. Those are all great places. If you want to get in touch with me personally, I do respond to emails. If it's a good email, like if there's a reason for me to respond, obviously, um, ty at tyfrankel.com. And, um, yeah, those are all great places to, to get in touch, to learn from me. Awesome. Yeah. Make sure you use this, uh, cold email framework if you email him. And then I want to, I want to see you dominate the YouTube space, man. Um, be the, the, be, be the next, uh, Iman guys are even bigger than him, right? It's time, um, Frank. Uh huh. Uh huh. Awesome. So, with that being said, that's been another episode of the Marketers Roundtable. If you're watching this on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe, Facebook, leave a comment below. Um, we'll get back to you. And with that being said, um, this has been one of my favorite conversations, one of my best conversations. And uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you, brother. It was a pleasure. Of course, man. Peace.